doesn't have that earth smell, it has a crap smell because of the way that it's digesting. Everything is tight and it's just a slower takedown and there are, this is, it's just got a different thing going. So we want to make sure that we are getting air down in the soil. This is very important, okay? Fast, we talked about that. Same thing, greatly reduce O2 availability. That's a great cause of oxygen depletion in the soil. Plants produce oxygen gas along with glucose and photosynthesis, but require O2 to break down glucose into ATP. So there's our sugar thing that the leaf is doing. That's actually why that triggered that thought in my head. I went down the rabbit hole and came out of it good. We're all right here. So this is what we need to take a look at. This is the free portion of aeration. All soils are affected by greater root density. Every soil, I don't care where you are, I don't care which part of the planet, what type of grass you have, all soils are affected by greater root density. Root density and the more stuff that comes from the plant that gets down deeper in the soil will start to give you options when we get into this screen here, okay? Addition of ligand to a program greatly increases O2 and fractures the soil for more airflow. Okay, this is where this, start. now we're starting to talk about the product here for a second, all right? Using materials that are in the product air rate, the way I do it, this is not a surfactant. It's not a wetting agent, it's not a heavy oil, it's nothing like that put into the soil that just gives you a temporary movement. It pushes through the soil and leaves pieces behind. That's what we're trying to do. We get a little bit of space and we put a wedge in. Just a little bit, wedge in. Okay, that's what we're doing throughout the entire soil. Using competitive pH material against your soil will aid in greater nutrient ability. So one thing that we've seen a lot of is when people put out aerate, they, they'll see a couple of things. When they put it out, and they put it out at either a heavy rate or a mild to heavy rate, they get a drying of the grass temporarily and then a big flush. Now, oftentimes, it's because there's a quick chemical reaction that's happening in the soil against some of the nutrient that's a little bound up, and it just suddenly flushes it up into the plant. That's what's happening. Okay, there's not anything in aerate that will contribute to green grass. There's nothing in it. So that means that whatever flush you see is coming from stuff that was bound up. That's good. So what does that mean? If it's not bound up, what did we just do? Release. Release something that was causing a block, right? So now we know, we, we, we know that there was something blocked. We created space, that means now roots are gonna be able to move better, the plant is gonna be able to grow better, and we've now created a little more space for <coughs> air. Now we are aerating. Yes? What's a couple of the things that it can free up or knock off the soil? Calcium is a big one. It can actually get that moving if you're in a high calcium area. Iron, opposite end of the pH. So in clays, where guys are dealing with a lot of heavy iron, one of the reasons they see dark green grass suddenly is because the iron gets switched into plant available. So we start to see that flow. Yes, skip up. How long does this typically free the soil up? So it depends on what else you do after it, right? Okay. So if you go back to your old ways, you're gonna tie it back up. You're gonna tie it back up. So if you can continue to, you, you wanna make sure you don't get right back on the salt bandwagon, all right? If you sin all week and go to church on Sunday and repent, stop sinning next week. You just got to keep going on, on a path that's going to lower your salt content, right? So just don't feed that back into it, and you'll do better over time. Because when we do salt, think about a few things like this. If you're running out, now honestly, this, this comes from readily available or I'm going to even call it cost-effective nutrients, okay? So if you run out with a, a bunch of FOS or a bunch of MOP or, or some of these other items, you are always leaving salts behind. You always will because the higher the nutrient content, the higher the load, the greater the salt left over when it's all done using everything. Every, all nutrients are salts. All nutrients are salts. Everything. Okay? So it's just part of life. But if you keep loading them in, you're going to create a soil where the roots can't uptake water anymore and it just drives everything out. So the stuff tends to close up, right? That's what happens. One of the greatest enemies to soil is dry soil, drought. That's bad. You can basically kill off your soil in a drought. You can kill it off in a flood. It'll all come back, like that video I showed you. That guy did nothing but add a couple little things and he grew topsoil and sand. It all comes back, so you don't have to freak out about it. Everybody calm down. But it. It, those are damaging. 
So you have to take a little more time to nurture it back in. And if you think about it, if you had a heavy drought and you've got water restrictions, you've got soil that's bound up, and you do like an hour watering on top of that soil, most of that's going to the street, right? We have to go in slowly. We're gonna get it slightly damp and then slightly more damp, and you just have to work it in to get water moving. Otherwise, surface tension is a problem. So, you know, I'm sure everybody has seen this before. There's droplet sizes on their lawn guns that go out and it hits a certain place so that it can disperse and go down to the ground. If you take a garden hose at any point and just point it at the ground, it just pools and runs, right? There's a surface tension that happens there. So the finer that that material is, the better it gets down into the ground. Okay, same thing. If you do a high volume of water on compacted stuff, it runs off. Doesn't actually even matter what your soil type is, that can happen. If it's totally dry, <coughs> that can just go. So think about the wet sponge, dry sponge. If you take a big sponge, you put it under your faucet and turn it on, full blast, water beads off of a sponge. You put a steady drip in there, that whole thing fills up. Right? That's a sponge. It's full of air and the ability to hold water, but if it's coming in too quick, you can't do it. Right? That's why sprinklers are designed the way that they are. If I mists go out, they actually get better water penetration. So there's, there's a lot of thought that goes into that process. Does anybody have any questions about this picture right here? <coughs> you know what this is? Yeah, this is, just, this is this is a thing that we'll get into with CECs a little bit later, but I, I, I like to bring it up for this, because this will preface what we talk about later. Imagine this is sand, and this is clay. That's all you need to know. That's sand, that's clay, okay? Larger particle, smaller particle. We've got areas that'll get clung to, we've got ions in those areas more on this than this. So what I like to put this thing up when we're talking about root mass and development is if I aim to, if I put a material down into the ground, and this is tightly down, right? It does have a lot of surfaces. If I can get in here and start to see these shift and break open and put another wedge in there, I actually created another bit of surface area for things to cling to and a little space. If I can drive a root and create some actually more like glue inside of sand. Sand relies so heavily on organic matter to function that anything that we can get in here, like a root to grow around this, we got more surface areas on the roots to grab things as well, so that when these little hair roots and stuff die, we've actually got other areas that'll start to weather that stone, weather that sand down and create more surfaces. So roots are one of the best things to break apart stone. Dry it down, they crack it open, and that's how it works. Well, you can do this on a much smaller scale to understand just aiding that process. Somebody's out of Yes. Not to stretch it out anymore, but oh, you, I'm, I'm I was done. able to see it on a very macro scale. You know, if you go, so we went on, on vacation to Mount Rushmore and I see these saplings, you know, no more than an inch and a half in diameter growing on a giant boulder. Mm -hmm. Very minimal soil. You know, the seed obviously sprouted in a crack with some leaf decay and things like that, very little organic <coughs> material, but then you see the roots wrapping around this boulder, and you know that eventually that tree and other plants are gonna dissolve the boulder, turn it into topsoil, and that's how that happens on a very large scale, but it was It's very, yeah, it becomes very more apparent. apparent. I, I think one of the most fun things for me um, is anywhere I can go to see erosion, like in a creek bed or river and there's oak trees or whatever's growing along the side and see the roots and what they're breaking into and see the surface layers of the soil and all the horizons that are down through that thing and we're just watching you know, clay turn into hard rock on the side of you know, how these roots just drive down through that stuff and pull things out. And they're just grinding away at that rock and pulling nutrients up, minerals out of this stuff that we don't get to see and essentially turning it into topsoil through the leaves falling off every year. I gotta take you to Gary, Indiana with me. Can we so sink? That, yeah, we can sink Gary, Indiana all the time. But I'm just saying, it's, you, it's, nature's taking that back over. It's destroying all the buildings and infrastructure. And you got- But there's nobody live there? There's people that live there. Oh. It's, it's kind of like it's Detroit, okay. where it's, it's oh, like, it's like they don't not I mean, you've got, you got like oak yeah. trees that are they they in the middle of the street. Yes. And, Tearing it all back up, it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. I don't know if everybody, anybody ever watched that show on Discovery Life After Humans. They, 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 they filmed out there. Yeah. Yes, Jay. 
I should. That's a great idea. All right, it looks like I'm going to Indiana. There you go. Uh, so, but I think that's really just important to note that your root structure can and will be the greatest aeration machine that you can possibly buy. So investing into root growth is going to give you a much greater result so that when you do sell your aerations to people with your machinery, it doesn't kill your machine. How about that? That's a cool spin on it. Why don't we make the soil soft anyway so that you can continue to sell those things and feel good about owning that piece of equipment and and hire some guy that you don't really like so much to go put out there on that thing and run around. You can still do it, but you can make it easier. That was a really good spin. I just thought of that just now because I don't want everybody in like that. So anyway, here's, here's where we're getting with this, with the addition of carbon. Okay, so the physical effects of the carbon are going into the soil, greater soil aggregation. Erosion is lessened, okay? That's very important. The greater the carbon in there, the less erosion you're going to get. This drainage is increased. You get more air because of this. Now, this is out of my lawn right here. This is soil that comes out of my backyard. And it's very well aggregated. It really is. And the roots run through that thing, and soil stays moist and drains well. There's no cooling water anywhere out there. It's working the way that it's supposed to. There's movement through there. There's plenty of air. I will never run an area across that thing. I have no reason to. Okay? So you get these like better results out of your soil. The chemical effects of getting carbon in the soil, greater cation exchange, uh, better metal complexity. So we're talking about the iron, freeing up the iron and getting things moved in there. Better buffering capacity, meaning that if you are putting things in there that could typically shock grass, it will actually help you a little bit to give you a little bit of a buffer with things going in there. Uh, greater supply and availability of NP and S. That's actually very important. Anything that you put in with greater carbon, that's why Matt was talking about the biochar, if you have more carbon in the soil, I'm actually going to talk about carbon and carbohydrates real quick. I think this is really good for everybody to understand. There's two very different things here, and it gets tied up together. Okay, there is carbon, and there are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are sugar, and eventually turn into carbon once it's all used up and spent. Carbon is dead. Carbon's dead. There's no energy in that material. Okay, so there's nothing for plants to use. It is there strictly for the soil. It is not a soil food. Humic acid is not a soil food. It does not feed any microbes. There's no food in it, it's dead. That is a shale rock, right? This is a dirty coal. It's, that's all it really is. So when we take it reactive, we're flushing the humic acid out of that shale, right? That's really what's happening. So, when you buy a humic acid powder or something that hasn't been reacted, just keep this in mind. The effects of that material are not the same as reactive <coughs> humic. It's been in the soil, sitting, decaying for millions and millions and millions of years, and it has gotten to the point that it can. All you're going to do is put it on top of something. It has not had any sort of other chemicals to go onto it to release the acid. So while its content may be 67 it's stuck. It's not the same. When you take a liquid and flush it, react it, you get all of the acids up into solution, and now the solution is usable. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Is, re like acid. is reacting just the process or removing the carbon from the acids? Sort of. Yes. Yes. Okay, so it, it requires an alkali extraction to get the most out of it. Okay, so we have a chemical reaction to yank acids away from stuff that's tied up. But I don't want to get rid of the carbon. So we have some leftover stuff in our process that is heavy, that doesn't need to go out on the lawn. It actually is more like clay. The stuff that gets reacted and is finished at the end, it gets together tight. So when it dries out, you can pull it out of, like, we put some in a tote and let the air just take away. It's almost like a wax of crayon when it's done. It's like this tight, pulled together, dried up stuff and you can draw on it's like wax. That, if you put that back down into the soil, can actually be combined. It's like it's too much stuff. Okay, so that goes away and you keep the acids and more of the ash content in the liquid. So what sets ours apart is I leave a lot of carbon in our human intentionally. 
We could run that through very, very fine screens and alleviate all that, and I get rid of all the surface area. What's the point? Now I'm getting away from that whole food again. I want that stuff in there. So uh, a few years ago, Helena took a sample of one of our totes. They, they saw it in somebody's shop, and they went in and took it to the lab, and they analyzed it, and they put out a tear sheet for their salesmen. It says, if you see anybody out there with this particular product, then here's the comparison on how to do it versus ours. And it showed under a microscope our product versus theirs. And like, it was pretty interesting, because I've never done that. Right? So in this tear sheet that they had for the salesman, you could see all the carbon in our product. You could see all these little bits and pieces of, of like stuff floating around in there. And theirs was perfectly clean. We had a higher humic content and more availability on our side. We were claiming 12%, we we're getting 14%. They're claiming 12%, they're getting 12.1% on a clean liquid, but the reactivity of what's going to happen in the soil was completely different. But they were saying, look how much cleaner ours is. Now this is under a microscope, you guys could not tell the difference. If I put the stuff in front of you and said it right here, you wouldn't know. There's reactivity in the soil because I want those surface areas, I want that material to hit down into the ground and create these spaces and pathways for roots and growth. Fair? So, I think it's important to understand those particular roles on how this goes forward and why the, why, here's why that's important, the reactivity that I was talking about. So when, when we are making, this is why the Air Aid product came to my mind and I thought it would be a good idea. And I, I just said, we'll just call it what it is because that's what it's going to do. When we do this reactivity with this Leonardite shale, we are taking a very, um, Light. There's not a whole lot of bulk density in that material. It's very light, it can blow away, just it's, it's, it's very fine stuff. We go through and we start breaking out these acids, and I was sitting somewhere, I don't know, maybe on top of a mountain, in lotus position. That doesn't happen, it was probably an ATV. So I, I thought, you know, if we can get that reactivity in a tank, why can't we do that in the ground? That was all. So most of these like strokes of genius are just like, I wonder what would happen if I did this? You know, it really, it comes from that. So we're releasing these organic acids out of the shale. Why can't I do that in the soil? So I use the same process. So when we put that material out, it works its way down into the soil and finds these things that have weak acids connected to it and starts to break them away. So anytime we can break something off, it creates space. Something becomes more plant available, we created more pathways. That make sense? Th that's it. That's the magic. That's why it works. Yes, John. John. Can I ask, um, you know, a lot of times you're kind of led to believe, you know, uh, you're opening up the soil time to seed. Uh -huh. You know, aeration and overseed. Yeah. So now if you're straying away from mechanically aeration, um, how, did, how would that affect your overseed? Because you're not open, opening up that okay. pathway for some germination. So I'm going to ask you a question. I ask everybody this question, so I'm not singling you out. When anybody asks me, I get this every single time. Have you ever had grass seed germinate on your trail? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Did you open up some soil for that? No. <laughs> 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 But there are times where you do aerate a bare spot. Sure. You'll throw down Fair. seed. I agree. Okay. Fertilizer, and you'll only get yes. Plus so that so let's talk about that for a second. If you were going to go through like this lawn, which you're probably not. That's bluegrass. It's not going to go and get overseeded. But if you're coming to the end of the season and you have a, an existing stand of turf, you can throw seed directly onto that, and it will germinate. You don't have to do anything except make sure it doesn't dry. Have you ever germinated seed in the paper towels? Yeah. We were all maybe in third grade once. I made it at least that far. We did that once. Science. Science. So, <coughs> you can get seed to grow without doing anything. It's been doing it. I don't know if you're aware of this, but like the entire plains before man showed up actually had grass on it. And it kept having grass on it. And nobody poked a hole anywhere. So, you don't have to, but to make it easier and have a better flow with your customer, if you've got bare soil, you need to seed in the soil because it's just going to dry up. That's your enemy. 
If you covered it with something, you know, if you guys are going to do I don't know, whatever you want to put out there, mulch or straw or anything else to cover up a bare area, and all you're going to do is just hit it with a seed spreader this way, you just have to cover the seed. That's all it needs. It needs to be damp, it needs to be cool, and the root will find its way into the soil. You can germinate, if you had grass that was this tall and the seeds got stuck an inch before the soil, they'd still sprout. And the root would work its way right down into the ground and everything would just get used up and you'd have grass growing. It can't, it's, there's really no control over that. But you're right, if you, have, if you plug something and you spread, those seeds that are protected will sprout and that's all that will sprout if it doesn't get covered up. So that's the exception in this equation. Okay? That's, that is the exception, is where you have bare soil, get the seed into the ground. Run a slit seeder if you've got one. Yep. You know, if you don't, just dust it and cover it over. Don't let the birds get it. Right? But you don't, this is the part that we're led to believe. The reason that most of us were led to believe that you have to poke a hole to do overseeding is because that's what we were sold on ages ago. This is just information that's just shortly been passed down. It's not old, but we accept it as true. It's, you know, 30 years old, 40 years old. It's not that old. So we, we, that's how it's been sold. Consumerism has driven bless you. most, bless you, most of the information. It's just because of consumerism. So we have to figure out, like, you know, a lawn care company in the 60s was sitting there like, I really wish we could do more than three applications a year. Three was normal. And everybody hear about the, you know, about the holiday, holiday fertility schedule? You guys familiar with that? That was marketing. Now we're up to four times. Maybe five, because there's an extra holiday now. You can throw five in there. Every day. Then you get towards the end of the season, and everybody's like, I sure wish we could get a fifth or sixth application. What are we going to do? You start selling people potassium. Now we get that. Now it becomes accepted that that's just when you do it, because of marketing not because of science, or need, just pure consumerism. <coughs> now we're like, we should aerate and overseed, and what we should really do is plant a grass that has to be done that way every single year, not one that sticks around. Now we've accepted that as cultural practice. I personally don't like having a new lawn every year. That's why I have the grass I do. It goes to sleep, it wakes up. It's a bear. I got bear grass. <laughs> So, I, you know, there's just these cultural accepted rules because, yes, there. So, um, so I'm kind of old school with the whole mechanical aeration thing. And we yes. We get away from that for a variety of reasons. But we typically look at that as doing it in the fall because mm -hmm. we can't get away from thinking about soil movement and earth development in the fall. So with this, with the liquid aeration I, uh, and the follow-up after because of what you're doing and trying to get things to release and we're actually so and so. Do you recommend this more in the springtime for our cool season grasses where we can get those benefits and taking up nutrients through the growing season that we our customers customers can see it first in the fall? Right. Let's talk about that. <coughs> yes. Yes. The earlier you can do something like this, the more benefit it is to you and your customer, but to you in general, because you're going to alleviate a lot of stress later. And, and, I, and, and a follow-up thing, if you want to talk. So last year we went out with this in the spring, and we mixed it with your deep, because we had some jugs that had deep batch around, mm -hmm. and, we, uh, and uh, the organic product, uh, the liquid organic product, it had a lot of microbial activity, and then we threw it out there. We saw what we think, and so we're going to try to duplicate that this year, but we thought some of those bonds that did that out, they had better disease resistance and a better color all here than the ones we can do on that same neighborhood. Probably and, so. And, and why was um, Why? Speak to that a little bit. Yeah. yeah what's in that deep, what was cooking there? Right, and the deep batch. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the deep batch. You guys will hear me say I don't fully support active biological products, things that have live, uh, cultures in them for a few reasons. Uh, one, that I think it negatively affects the soil over time by loading and starting to chew through organic matter and stuff is there. Uh, if you continue to use it, you can run into issues. Okay, and if anybody was on Holganics for a while, you probably saw something like that. 
where it just started to get deteriorating results over time. People have seen this. Um, I've seen it with other products. I don't want to single them out, and I don't want to say anything bad about that. It's just what's so. The material built up to a point, and your nutrition went south, and the soil got queued up. What you did, if you were putting that on lawns that had heavier thatch or organic matter or something, or you're just trying to get rid of material, whatever that might be, here's what happens. The aerial product has this sort of surfactant effect. It's very oily. It, it's slippery, and it moves through soil pretty quickly. That's one of the reasons it works. It's got this sort of greasy feel about it. It gets down into the ground. The deep batch product does have some live culturing in it. It does. <laughs> And there's a reason for that. I want it to get hot and eat what's on the surface and then die. That's what I want. I want it to be a quick fix, not something you do over and over and over. The cool thing about it is this, and, and this is where people are going to start finding value in using that particular product, is if you put it out in the heat and you do have heavier thatch, you've got buildup of litter and things like that, it's going to convert that into nutrients for the grass. And it's going to chew it up. You basically created a compost bin. And it makes it feed the turf for longer. Because it's organic in, so you're breaking down inside of that material. And all those minerals that those grass clippings have, it's going to go back into the plant. All right? And if you threw even another live culture on top of it, those things started to work even faster. Okay? And chew through it. So if we got through that batch layer and through some of that built up OEM, we created more nutritive field for the turf, now you can have grass that lasts longer, stays green longer, they said and you have gotten rid of your disease bed. That's probably what I saw. So we, uh, I don't ever do lives. So I'm, I'm an old guy, but more, you know, doing this forever, and we got away from calling it liquid aeration out of gather. We right. wanted to, we just call it biosoil stimulant. Sure, that's fine.
So sometimes, okay, so uh, I, I talked a little bit about this last year, that there are some chemicals, some, some things that do not like being mixed with high pH materials. I can tell you this, this is just general care for your tanks and what you're doing. If you leave a, a herbicide or an insecticide in your spray tanks overnight, it loses efficacy, whether it's mixed with anything I do or not. So make sure you get your tanks out every day. That's, I'm just gonna say that, all right? I can also say this. I know that in agricultural times, I have seen this happen. I'm going to bring it up, and it doesn't, won't really affect too many people in this room. When we were running our, um, essentially, the green start, it was a starter fertilizer for agriculture, putting it out there. If a guy got rained out of his field, um, some of these guys were spraying it on. Okay, so they would do it at time of Roundup. So they were mixing in their Roundup in the tanks and then putting our stuff in it, and they got rained out. Took a day or two, and they went to spray. Found it didn't work. Period. It just didn't work. Full failure. And they're like, I have more weeds than ever, and it's your product's fault. You're right, it is. It is. Because it neutralized that. So that's actually one of the benefits of using a humic product, anyway, is it cleans soil, it cleans contaminants, and pulls stuff away. So you can do remediation <coughs> with it. But you should check if there's labels, and I know Rod spoke about this last year, we were talking about pH and some chemicals and things like that. Most of it is fine, but there are labels that'll say, you know, get your tank balanced like a seven or whatever. Okay, so just check your label and see, that's all. Hey. Uh, I just want to share a little story about ME. Yes. Um, whoever was the operator before me where I work, probably purchased our fungicide, maybe three, four years old. It was kicked up to a point where you couldn't even get it off the box. Because it is in a hundred degree container for maybe five years. Alright, I, I like to throw things away because we do have a farm and a nursery, so anything I try to use that we're not gonna put out in the field, put some air in on it. Yeah. Let it sit for like two, three days. I probably come back two, three days later and I, I actually can't shake it feels like there's rocks inside now. Three, four, five, six days later I come and it's even more looser. Maybe within two, three weeks, it's completely liquid. I'm not gonna go and claim it was fungicide. I'm not gonna go and just spray in someone's yard, but I can just throw it in the nursery. That's cool. Get something out of it, you know. It just breaks everything. Yeah. It just completely. So if it's like you said, if it's in your tank or your hose, it's gonna clean it eventually. You know? it's just gonna it is. It is a real heartbreaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will. It will clean your tanks. <laughs> Is uh, air eight have a high pH? Yes, it does. So that's why, like you know, you guys that are in these sort of clay zones with red clay might see a green up, a dark green grass because of it, because it's high pH and it's releasing iron up into the plant. It's that bound up stuff. Yes, sir. Crabgrass on Saint Augustine. You see these people putting steak and soda on. What does that do? Actually, fresh grass. <laughs> it turns it bright, it, like something more like in a day. I was wondering if that does something to like the pH. I would just assume that that soda in there just dries everything out. It just but it doesn't away. really screw the same oil. It does. It's just it, it's being direct. It's not like you know you, you're going out there just putting that straight. You're not going like. Well, they have customers that. What happened here? Like, can we smell gas or whatever? They're like, no, I sprinkled baking soda on the crabgrass. Uh, it, it screwed it up. Well, you, and, can, uh, you can even have more fun with it. and put like a bunch of baking soda on it and pour vinegar on top of it. You know, burn that <laughs> shit right out of it. <laughs> St. Augustine are actually moves that in. It it mm -hmm. and then kind of. Right. Yeah, it's just a quick soda buildup and then things can move back into this space. It just has to flush. So when would you use the, the difference between using liquid aerating and possibly going with your straight healing product? Okay. Well, I say straight healing. That's a good question. That's a good question. Humic is a wonderful cleanser, but what it, it does best is it works with whatever else you're putting it with. Okay, so you can run it by itself. You can, and you can have some cool soil corrective stuff, but it adapts itself to whatever you put it with. So if you're going to run it with nitrogen, you can run lower amounts of nitrogen. If you're going to run it with a weed control, you can do this or that. It, it hooks itself around whatever you can do. So 
You can use it as a cleanser. If you've got soil remediation to do, you can do heavy, heavy applications of it and start, it'll start <coughs> grabbing things and pulling stuff out of the soil. It works the same way in blood. You can pull the gas and can pull heavy metals out of your blood. Okay, it's the same thing. It's looking for stuff to latch itself onto. Very much like distilled water. It's just an empty vessel ready for whatever you put into it, and then it starts to work that direction. So there's not really a time for that. If you've got compaction, or you've got low K, or you've got just soil that needs more work, I'll recommend aerate first, but consider it humic on steroids. Okay? So yes? Uh, we're spraying that out. I know you say do it in the spring. Is that because of rainfall? No, nah, you can really do it any time. But the one thing I will recommend is if you're spraying it in the summer and you're using low volume, because of that extra potassium, it has a drying effect on the turf. Okay, so you will want to get some water. Now, uh, Michael, how many liquid aerates do you offer? What do you do when you sell that package? I usually do. Well, I try. I definitely sell the one. I always try to do one in the fall. <coughs> I'll spring it all. Now, he's been doing uh, offering this as part of his program for a while. He's only been using ours for like a year. He did soil tech and different things like that. This guy's been marketing that for five years? Five years. Five years. If you guys have questions about how to market this material, are you open to talk to people about that around lunch or whenever? Okay. So he was doing this for his customers, killed all of his aerators, doesn't even offer that as a thing, and just runs liquid. That's just what he's been doing. And guess what? Customers still have grass. <laughs> so that's good. Ryan Orr. So what's the difference between like sports turf, golf, and like their methods of, like I was at a golf course probably two, three weeks ago and we kind of talked a little bit about aeration and he's like, if I could aerate every single day, I would. Now it's an, obviously a different thing when you're talking about compaction at a golf course versus a home, but like still the theory of why they do what they do. Okay, great question. Now that's typically going to be around greens. That's we're talking greens at that point. Sand based greens, built the you know, the USGA spec thing. Uh, they don't want organic matter in there, right? Because they're mowing grass down to like you know whatever it is, one thirty second. It's down to nothing. So any organic matter in there is going to be a problem. It's going to lead to disease. So. They go through and poke holes into that thing to dry it up and fill it back up with sand and then sweep those greens so that all that material goes away. So they're using the techniques that I said are bad for lawns to their benefit because they want to get rid of that stuff and here we think we're actually making a difference and making it better. They're actually trying to do that stuff that I'm saying is happening. They want to get rid of that organic matter. They don't want it to build up and yeah, they would. The only problem is it causes so much damage to the turf that they have to sell their green skis for less every time they do it come back in and put a whole bunch of new sand in and then it takes a little bit for that grass to grow back over and then they're back in action. But it's a disease thing, it's a heat thing, it, it, and that's, and they're also pulling like 12 inch deep. So how about a field though that's like, let's say it's just a, a football field that's mowed like a native field or something like that, that they're still going in and like coring it all the time or deep tying or whatever. Okay, so here's why that typically happens is this, um, <coughs> because there are children that stand there, <laughs> play sports like this, and just like stand, they stomp down on the center line. They think that they have to area because the grass won't grow, it gets all just packed in because of kids. Ruin <laughs> <laughs> all the fun. No, that, and that, you know, I worked with some of this stuff in fields in Park City like 15 years ago because of that very thing. You know, once there's a mud pit out in the middle, they have to shut the field down and rest it, and then go, and that's how they just come in as quick. It's like aerate the seed and try to just get something back in there. And then these idiot kids would come back in there. <laughs> all over there. You know, like, just run. Why are you standing there? Just run, run that way. Get off that. So, but we did actually see a lot of, I did some injecting and some work out there, and, and we were actually able to do faster recovery on that stuff, just because that's purely compaction. It's just human caused foot traffic and so that's the way they think they have to deal with it because they're probably going to throw a seed out or something and it's bare. So that's it's just kind of like a mindset then for them, like that's how it's always been type of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, this, this is a unique circumstance. Yeah. You know, pile of children standing at one point, crying, yelling at each other, high-fiving sometimes, and then just killing the grass. And they just have to fix those areas. So again, but it's, it's like isolated, right? 
like the center line to the goalie, but there's the places where everybody stands. The rest of it's fine. Just those areas is where it's getting a ton of foot traffic. So to kind of with some of the stuff you're saying, golf is different. You yeah. can if if you don't have the funds to rebuild your greens, I used to run a golf course verification service. We traveled from Jacksonville, Amelia Island, all the way to Naples. And you can you can exchange enough material doing deep time verification to re essentially rebuild a green without rebuilding your green. Um, we used to aerate Vero Beach Country Club. Yeah. Um, we, we have a bayonet time. Old school superintendents wanted pencil times, solid times. You're not pulling a core. A, a bayonet time is just like a t you know the knife on your end of your rifle. It's a bayonet. It goes in, kicks out, and comes up. After you do that, you can run your Smith Co. your sideways roller, roll it. It closes the, the playing surface. You can play on it immediately after, not affect your roll, but you're getting it opened up. And you also, you know, with like professional greens, I mean, you're looking at roots that are going to go down three feet or so. And you can get binding also, and that's part of it. We, we would typically, your, your normal course that was doing two, three verifications a year, half inch by seven times. Um, we would, some courses who had big budgets, we would run a quarter inch time, you know, four or five times a year, pull a couple, you know, half inch, and then go to solid times in the winter. Um, but we could go, you know, one inch by seven. We could go half by 12. We had a deep time machine that did 18 inches. But you're talking about big expensive equipment at that point. Yeah, and you can't get that through anybody's lawn. We, we, we did a couple homes, you know, that have golf yes. at their house. Yes. Right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's foot traffic. If you put that much foot traffic, that much machinery on your home lawn, you would have extreme compaction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it also takes significant everything else. More water, more fur, more everything to maintain that. So again, if you have customers that want a golf course, they can hire you full time. 85000 bucks a year, sorry. I'm sure there's people that will pay it. I'll just put it out of credit. <laughs> Any other questions? Did I get everybody covered? Okay. 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 Matt. Yes, sir. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, everybody stand up and stretch. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm going to go not talk to the floor. I don't have one. Oh, you didn't bring it? That was borrowing Jake's or whoever's. I'm going to go get my uh, 